Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is uh, Rav Shmuel Ben Yehoshua, Rabbi Stephen Epstein, Rashbi in the house. I haven't said that in a while, so here it is. I, I just like to have a little fun with it. I don't mean to be disrespectful or make light of it. This is serious stuff, but I don't see why we can't have a little fun with it. So, Parsha Ha'azinu, 5785. We're into next year. We've gone through the high holidays when we start reading this uh, portion. It's read on Shabbat Shuva, which is the portion between Rosh Hashanah and also uh, Yom Kippur on the 6th of October. So before we get to that, I always like to have a little commentary. So let's let's talk a little bit about what Judaism is. And this kind of runs a little bit into what we've been reading on the last three Parshas. Moses is basically warning, warning Israel, okay? I know you're a stiff-necked, stubborn people, right? I know that you're very willful. I took you, I took your, well, in this case, their parents, because he's talking to the new generation that's going to go in and conquer and settle the land. He goes, I brought your parents out and, you know, they complained uh, when I took too long to come down from Mount Sinai, they put up, a, they built, a, they made a golden calf as an idol or as a representative of God. We still don't know what they thought it was, right? You know, 3,500 years later, um, they went out, you know, they spy the land. They come back with these tales of woe. And God finally says, I'm, I'm done. I've had enough, you know, and that's why you're here. So don't do what your parents did. But I know that future generations will. I know that when you get all fat and happy and you're being successful and you know, you're know you defeating your enemies, you're gonna think it's all you, you're gonna forget about God and bam, there it is. So Moses reminds them, covenant folks, okay? All of you standing here today, all of you that are not here, past generations, maybe future generations, you took a covenant with God, you made an agreement, God will watch over you. In return, we've got these 313 mitzvot minus the 200 some odd that we can't do because there's no uh, temple standing anymore, but this is your agreement. Now, I have had the pleasure and the honor of sponsoring people that want to become Jewish after they're born as well as doing baby namings for boy, newborn boys, newborn girls, give or take uh, their ages, um, and welcoming, the, welcoming them into the covenant. And if you look at the outset, Judaism is not an easy religion to adopt, whether you're born into it or whether you choose it after you're born. There's all these regulations, okay? There's the Shabbat, you have to rest. There's a lot of things you don't do. You don't rip, you don't tear, you don't build. You know, some people think, what do I do? Sit in the dark for 25 hours? What is it? All right, you go to synagogue, okay? But you can't drive, you have to walk. There's all these rules, okay? There's so many rules that it is the longest tractate of the Talmud, which is all about the laws, the rabbis going back and forth, what you can do, what you can't. Beit Hillel has, you know, is more progressive. Beit, Beit um, Shammai is a little bit more restrictive. Um, and there's like four volumes. You know, out of 72 volumes in the uh, Art Scroll edition, anyway, four of them are your Shabbat. If you look at the Shulchan Aruch, the set table, which uh, a rabbi wrote during the Middle Ages, it's basically a 2,000 page, or maybe 1,000 page Hebrew, 1,000 page English laundry list of what of of the rules and shabbat is is so much of it it's almost one quarter of it you know and then you've got kashri you know eat this not that you know you want to go out for a hamburger well is it kosher all right let's say you're kosher style i want to eat the hamburger is it a cheeseburger was it made in an oven where cheeseburgers were made even though there's no cheese on that so you've got all these rules and you're thinking why do people want to be jewish i mean why do you want to follow all these rules and they do it for the spirituality. So back when I was a kid, here we go. <laughs> you know, when we used to walk uphill to go to school both ways and through the snow and you know, all that stuff. Okay. So I was brought up at a time when the Holocaust was still in sight. And uh, conservative Judaism then was a little bit more demanding, actually a lot more demanding than 
it is today. We went to Hebrew school three times a week, not just once, not just Sunday, and then a little bit on Thursday or whatever people do today. Um, we had classes. We had a large synagogue back in Long Island. There was a lot of Jews there. And we had, when I say two classes, it was two classes of people, of kids that were going into their bar mitzvah. We had a bar mitzvah every week. And the following year, they had to double up. They had to have two. So that was Judaism. We learned a lot. Okay. Then I graduated college and I had some time and I thought, okay, this, that study was over. And I wanted to learn about Judaism. I was very fascinated. I just, you know, I'm a rabbi today. Obviously, I've always been into it. But I wanted to learn more. Got a couple of books on Judaism. Didn't really do it for me. So I said, you know, they gave me the Hertz Humash for my bar mitzvah. I'm going to read that. I started reading and I started calling myself a born again Jew. Now, some people think, wait, what do you mean born again? No, not that born again. The fact I tell people that I spent my childhood, my earlier years, my formative years, going through Hebrew school, being bar mitzvah. I went to Israel. I'd gone to Israel twice. Um, and now I read the Chumash and it started to put everything together. You started to see the spirituality, the beauty of Judaism, the way Rabbi Dr. Hertz puts things. It was just such an inspiration to me, learning the reason. You know, with all the Hebrew school, I never really understood why. We don't say Baruch Shem Kavod out loud, at least in the conservative and the Orthodox movement. Okay. Yes, because it's not in the Torah, it separates the uh, declarative Shema from the imperative, uh, the Ahavta, et cetera. That's two reasons. Okay, and it really drove things home. When people come to us and they said, I want to learn more about Judaism, I'm fascinated. I've read the Torah, didn't know there was this thing called Judaism, and now I'm fascinated and I think I want to be Jewish because I love the principles. I love the precepts. It's not because they want to live a restricted life. It's not because they don't want to have to, they don't want to be able to do anything on Shabbat because they love the spirituality. They love the idea of one true divine God. They love the idea that if you mess up, you're not going to an eternity of hell, right? That, you know, the body temptations are not necessarily bad. It's just what you do with them. You know, it's a very fair, this is what people like. This is what people want. This is why Moses is telling people, you know, that he wrote all the laws in the book and he, and he says, you know, visit Jerusalem every seven years when you when you're not working your land or herding your cattle because they get the the year off go to Jerusalem listen to the king read parts of Deuteronomy or all of Deuteronomy whatever they read they're still not sure today you know but but definitely and and learn the laws and and and, and go to this go to the temple when you want to be grateful for escaping danger after you've come back from a seafaring adventure you know this is three thousand years ago or when you got sick and got well, or when a, a woman gave birth and didn't die. Even today, people go on planes. You're in this metal tube, right? What, five miles above the earth with nothing below you, and you have this propulsion. You have a couple of guys sitting in the front steering the thing, you know, and you're walking around and, you know, nothing below. So when you land, it's like, yeah, I'm giving thanks the thing didn't crash, right? Um, even hospitals today, I know somebody that went into a hospital, it seemed like it was something minor. Next thing you know, the guy's, he's gone. So we give thanks for things. You know, we give thanks for our life. We, we see that God is looking over us. In Judaism, we understand that when you have an issue, a challenge, it's because God's testing you. God wants you to grow, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Look at Moses. Ha'azinu is like his, I guess they call it a swan song. It's his final message. He waxes poetic. It's done uh, in the Torah as a song in two columns because the columns, you know, they hold what's up above, but any other stress in the columns, this, you know, will, will give way and the whole thing will come tumbling down on you. Just ask Samson, right? That's what he did, you know, to, to kill the Philistines. So that's why it's in that structure because folks, you're, you're, you're very tentative. You know, you have to really pay attention and not get involved in what the other nations around you were doing. If they were doing righteous things, <laughs> Israel wouldn't have a mission. We wouldn't need a mission. They do human sacrifice. You know, the, the, the king or his, 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 his uh, ministers are the ones that decided court cases if, you know, hopefully they weren't in a bad mood that day. Okay, this is what the ancient nations did. We said, no, that's not what you do. There's justice. If you have any 
type of interest and what's going on, you recuse yourself and you don't even think about it. You don't even risk the fact that maybe you can't make an objective decision. This is Jewish justice. Very simple. Be fair. That's what Judaism is all about. And that's what Hazina is. You know, people say, well, why does Moses have to go on to his great, you know, to the great beyond? Why can't he cross the land? Because he had a lot of responsibility and, you know, he didn't mess up once. He messed up a few times. You know, it wasn't just that rock thing. There were some other things going on. And by the way, everybody was looking at him. He didn't sanctify Hashem. That was the issue. He, he didn't do it. And God's like, I can't let this go, Moses. Sorry, but, you know, in the world beyond, you know, everybody's going to remember your name. You're going to be the greatest prophet ever. And that's your legacy. And that's a beautiful legacy. Okay, so I've kind of combined a little bit of a drash, a little bit of a sermon, uh, a Devar Torah here. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing you for high holidays. Please let me know if you have any questions. And as always, this is Rashbi. Thank you again for joining us.